actor Marilyn Waring to the stage. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thank you very much, Tricia, and Stella, thank you for your invitation. Um, I've been set a fairly tight agenda um, for 25 minutes, and because I like to uh, talk illustratively, uh, as opposed to uh, just with a lot of wheelbarrow words, um, the, this is what I hope to uh, get through. So my focus is going to be uh, the United Nations system of national accounts from which is derived GDP. But I'm going to talk about that, the emergence of that in 1953. And I'm going to take us through some words that a lot of economists really don't uh, often come across in especially when they're studying economics. Now, economics is a social science and it's no more value-free or clinical or objective than any other social science, but it's frequently not taught that way. And it often escapes off to the business faculty uh, to sever ties with other social sciences. So the GDP, the system of national accounts emerges from a particular paradigm, okay? That paradigm is built up over centuries. If you read political economy in Europe books, you'll see that uh, century by century, a number of Eurocentric white men laid out the basic ground rules for what was determined to be national income, uh, what was seen to be productive work. Uh, and this culminates in the uh, Second World War when John Maynard Keynes is working on the British national income. Uh, and so is um, Sir Richard Stone. Uh, and they are demonstrating in terms of, they write pamphlets called things like the British national income and how to pay for the war. And that the increase in output comes easily because of the new defense plants, the new equipment, it's much more valuable to convert your steel from farming equipment into armaments and munitions from the decline in unemployment, an increase in labor hours per week, and from shifting production from civilian goods to raw materials where the pay rates were better. So the foundation of what emerged in 1953 of these first rules emerges from this particular paradigm of national income and how to pay for the war. It also emerges in the early 1950s as we begin a huge surge of decolonization. Now, old colonial powers were very interested in knowing uh, to what extent the investments that their particular corporates or companies had made in the countries that were formerly part of their colonial empires, what kind of productive capacity would remain in those countries. So this is another reason why as colonial powers moved through uh, decolonization, they invariably established a set of national income accounts to try to continue to look out for this. Um, at the same time in 1953, the entire ecosystem, except when we were mining it, exploiting it, deforesting it, overfishing it, etc., the entire ecosystem was absent from the system of national accounts, except when we were exploiting it. So this is the paradigm we lay down. It's also the ontology of what's are down, what is real in the world. So what is real in the world at this point is obviously 
War is good for growth. And obviously, exploitation of the environment is fabulous for growth. Then the next part of this is what we call epistemology. How do we know what we know? Well, those who established the boundary of production in 1953 certainly only recorded the lives that they knew. That was male lives. Male wage and salary earners who were in productive activities or in manufacturing and services. And the rule in, the 19, in 1953 was really very explicit. It did say some subsistence activities could be included, but they tended to be mining, quarrying, obviously things mended. But then it said all other activities were non-primary and that non-primary producers and their work was of little or no importance. So in that simple two-line phrase, pretty much all the unpaid work on the planet, whether it was unpaid subsistence agriculture, um, unpaid uh, transmission and reproduction of indigenous values, uh, it, 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 all volunteering, <clears throat> um, all unpaid housework, all unpaid family members in uh, households that were active in the market, etc. So in fact, the establishment of that boundary of production left the most work done on the planet outside of the national income accounts. And when you leave activities outside of the GDP figures, if you're invisible as a producer in a nation's economy, you're invisible in the distribution of benefits, unless you're thought of as welfare or a problem. Now, so it, it lined up in 1953, we have decolonization, how to pay for the war and patriarchy. <coughs> And the system of national accounts then has a change in the boundary of production in 1968. Um, it's minimal, but it includes uh, some more subsistence activities. But another thing that happens then that is extraordinarily important, uh, and it happens because um, the uh, United Nations had declared a UN development decade. Now, in 1953, the key figure that was established was called gross national product. Gross national product. And in the middle of the UN development decade, they were scratching their heads because gross national product uh, is the indicator that measures production that generates income for a country's residents, okay? Gross national product generates income for a country's residents. But I can remember when I first looked at this and a, and a, a, a company like Unilever in Zaire um, was in fact responsible for two thirds of the production in that country but of course it wouldn't be being registered as GNP so they changed they changed the indicator to gross domestic product because that measures production that generates income in a nation's economy whether the resources are owned by that nation's residents or otherwise so there was a very interesting just little slip of the pen there that now begins to demonstrate, I think it's more of the um, decolonial element. In 1993, there were some really major changes. Up till 1993, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the International Labour Organization, and the system of national accounts 
all had different definitions of employment. So finally, in 1993, they determined they would have a solid basis. So first of all, it was that provided you worked paid for one hour in the past week, you were determined to be employed. You were also supposed to be counted as employed if you worked unpaid in a family business. Um, the boundary of production changed dramatically under pressure in particular from women statisticians and African statisticians, so that the boundary of production was specifically to now include things like subsistence agriculture, carriage of water, collection of uh, fodder, collection of forage for uh, fires, fuel wood, etc. So it seemed as if there was this dramatic uh, opening to count other than household uh, kind of contained activity. Um, for a little while, some of us had some hope that at least uh, women's activities would now be visible. Um, but that just didn't happen. Firstly, because even when the material, the information was collected, um, as it has been in uh, India, that um, the data has not then been generated so that we're getting results that say 28% um, of women are engaged in um, subsistence agricultural activities. Um, when the uh, material is looked at again by feminist economists, the figures are like 86, 87%. So that's not happening for us. In addition, the United Nations Statistical Division has <laughs> instructed the world that actually trying to collect all the data of these little units um, might be too much for your statistical capacity. So only look at the large ones. Um, so then we move to uh, changes in the rules for 2008. But even before the rules were published in 2008, and you'll remember the global financial crisis, they were already out of date. There are enormous issues <coughs> in globalization. It is extraordinarily difficult to tell sometimes when ownership of something um, changes because uh, ownership has nothing to do with where the product actually is. Um, so in New Zealand, I can be constructing something um, that's using widgets from Bangladesh and Taiwan and exporting it to Poland, but uh, all the income accrued is supposed to be here where no activity <laughs> really took place, just the ownership took place. Um, value chains are impossible for trying to work out where does production occur and how many times we double counting. Digitization is a nightmare. Measuring financial intermediation, well, all of you have probably just noticed uh, what's been happening with Pandora. Uh, and how many billions um, are exposed there and how those financial intermediation services are, ex are expected to be counted as goods for the gross domestic product. Um, there are problems about whether to measure trade by volume or by value. There's this vast multinational use of tax havens We've got large numbers of countries that don't even have up-to-date GDP figures for the 1993 rules, let alone the 2008 rules. And I really don't understand why anybody believes this data anymore. So um, I think that the combination uh, of COVID and the climate crisis says to us, there has to be another paradigm. 
there's no point pretending that the GDP can be resuscitated, um, that it should remain the prime um, indice. Uh, people try to say, well, we've got sustainable development goals now. And so, you know, uh, the GDP is supposed to um, stand aside a little for those. But the collection of data on those is woeful. And the, <laughs> the area where the data collection is the worst is on the gender SDG. Um, now, are there alternatives and are there different ways of thinking? Well, those of us who have the privilege of growing up in Aotearoa, New Zealand, are very familiar with the fact that there are other ontologies and epistemologies and methodologies. There are other ways of thinking about um, uh, value. There are other ways of thinking uh, about well-being, and in particular, uh, the Teikupenga survey, which was conducted by Statistics New Zealand <coughs> in 2013 and 2018, begins to demonstrate uh, very different ways so that, for example, you see these significant differences and tensions ontologically, epistemologically, between communal versus individual values, between spiritual and secular values, between ecology-driven and consumer-driven values, consensual versus conflictual uh, values, and collaborative as opposed to competitive values. So we know, and so do Indigenous people all around the world, that there are different ways of thinking. There are different paradigms. The environment is now so stressed that I hope nobody thinks that, that there is any use anymore for, um, cash, uh, for um, CBA analyses of whether or not we can despoil another part of the planet. Um, where we're just completely past that point. This is about regeneration and stopping. This is not about adding to GDP and thinking that that is some kind of indicator of well-being. Um, there are, there ha have been other um, indicators, sort of outside of GDP, but they've still abstracted market values. So they kind of sit on the fringe. The index of sustainable economic welfare uh, or uh, genuine progress indicators. And in fact, there's a genuine progress indicator bill just come before the US Congress, which will be interesting. My own preference is time use as the um, new paradigm. Everybody in the world has exactly the same amount of it. That's a very good start. You don't have a boundary of production that shuts out the majority of the people on the planet for a start. Um, I believe that we no longer have one unidimensional indicator. Time use is extraordinary because it demonstrates where people are the most time poor and the most time poor are usually the most vulnerable in a community. Men are very resistant about time use surveys because invariably uh, it demonstrates that women use more time in work paid and unpaid than they do. Time use is also very important for measuring voluntary and community work for indigenous reproductive work uh, a number of the uh, indicators in Te Kupinga ask people if they had spent time in activities for kaitiakitaka, for example, or whanangatanga. Um, I think that we already are collecting the best sort of environmental indicator data that we can. There is no point at all 
in abstracting any of this to economic values and in wasting that time, just the data itself measured in terms of its own characteristics is the information we need. We want teiku penga, we want to embrace Pacific Māori values in this country. And yes, there's room for GDP, but over there in the corner, and with us understanding that it's well past its use by date and is not helpful for us to make very good policy. One of the things that always amazes me is that people talk about GDP as if sitting around a cabinet table, politicians are only interested in whether the GDP is up or down. You know, we have more and more well-trained, well-educated politicians, at least in this country, we're lucky. Um, and they do have the capacity, as we have seen through COVID, to put a great deal of evidence on the table and to try to make the best judgments from this mass of evidence. I'm very grateful that our cabinet wasn't sitting around the table just asking whether our GDP figures were up or down. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Waring, were there, um, was there any questions from our participants this evening? That was such an awesome presentation. Thank you. Hi, I had a question. Hey, hey Francesca, go for it. Um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of your ideas about time use, instead of GDP as a measure of economic activity, what would be, do you see there being a sort of goal in terms of the time use of um, an economy? So for example, with GDP, it's um, growth, uh, G GDP growth, right? Um, the time use, do you, do you think there should be a goal like that? Uh, yeah, well, the most important one is to um, find out who doesn't have time. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's a very, very good policy instrument. Um, if you, if you, um, when we look at um, vulnerable communities, they are overwhelmingly time poor. You know, just think of how much longer it takes to do laundry, how on earth you get to dry things if you don't have the assets that I have in my home. Um, everything takes longer. So time poverty is important. Um, in fact, Treasury is very, very interested <laughs> in people not working, meaning in paid work, for more than 50 or 60 hours a week and ensuring that they get plenty of rest and leisure. Um, but there are other things too. This is an, so, for example, we never talk time, the time, the additional time it takes a woman to be pregnant, right? The additional time that lactation adds to a woman's day, the additional time that caring for people. Um, and in that becoming both paid and unpaid work and leaving no time for self-well-being or for looking after yourself. The situations we have seen through COVID where young people are pulled from school because they can get uh, a position to help sustain the household or they're pulled um, to care for somebody who needs 24 hours, seven days a week attention. You know, it's you learn a lot. You learn a great deal um, with time as a really extraordinary policy signal. So you're just you're trying to make sure you're looking at it as a, a well-being indicator. Um, you're um, looking at 
Um, and you have it on the table, of course, with your environmental material, with your data about voluntary and community work, right? It's it doesn't it doesn't kind of sit in isolation. It has a very rich amount of detail all around it. You can you can look at um, different age groups, different gender, different um, rural urban situations. It, the way you can cut time use data also can impact enormously on policy. Um, let me just push out one more on this. Um, it may not happen in my lifetime. I suspect it might, but it may not happen in my lifetime. Um, but I definitely think uh, that at some stage, um, we are going to move to um, having everybody uh, paid. And I often say to people, well, in New Zealand, we already do that for a really substantial number of the population, those who are aged over 65. And it doesn't stop them working in paid work and th their community and voluntary work tends to um, increase then. So we already have some interesting data to move down that track. Thank you. Thank you for that, Francesca. And I see uh, Lola has got her hand up as well. Go yes. for it, Lola. Um, kia ora. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Waring, um, for this wonderful corridor and also all the work you've done over the years. I've had a really fun time engaging with your work in both my feminist and my development studies courses over this, my last year of my undergrad. So thank you. You've made it a lot more fun. Now, now, um, my question is always how the environment is like a really important part about this entire issue of almost having to revalue about what we think is valuable and how we measure economics. And of course, time use looks a lot more on the social side and how well-being works. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on the environmental side of that, especially with the climate crisis and all that going on at the moment. Yeah, OK, so um, I... Um, I really like New Zealand's state of the environment reports that are put out by the ministry. Um, now, a number of, there are a number of reasons why I like them. Number one is that um, they just, they utilize so much of everything that's out there, right? They don't just say the sustainable development goals only require us to report on this, Treasury only requires us in terms of environmental capital to report on this, so that's all we're going to do. They really go for it. The moment that there's a new piece of data it comes into the system, they enter it. When they know there's an issue, but they don't have measurements, they narrate it. They don't let it disappear from the report just because they don't have the data. Now, that's the kind of sophistication that I'm looking for to be on the table. Um, it's what we call a kind of open architecture. It means the more you find, the more you add, right? You don't just stop at that point because now we've got everything we need for international comparators, so we we'll stop. No, you know, it's not what we're about. So I, that's what, and I'm not interested in abstracting any of that to dollar values, right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, for example, um, I don't think, I think it was the taxpayers team um, who tried to find out how much it, kept, it cost to keep the orchid calf alive. And I just thought to myself, oh, well, that was a bit in bad taste, wasn't it? You know, like, like if it if it if it had survived, you think we could put a price on it? Um, so I think we need to get rid of that kind of idea. 
Lola, just it, it, this data that we have here is what we need, not what it would be worth if we put all of that totara through a mill. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Susie, I saw you out there. Hi, Marilyn, how are you doing? <laughs> How are you? We could just excuse everybody and have a little catch up. <laughs> You've moved again. <laughs> I have. Welcome yeah. to the new view. <laughs> um, yes, I'm now thinking about older people for a living, Marilyn. So um, we can talk about, yes, we should have a chat about that at some time. Um, for now, in the context of your presentation, I was thinking, obviously, most of the challenge that you lay out is for, you know, for, for politicians and for policy officials to kind of do things differently, which obviously I fully support. I wonder, is there a call for us in our individual citizen capacity? And if so, what is the scope for us to, to help make change, whether it's to be towards a wellbeing economy, if you want to use that language, or simply an economy that's more positive for the planet and the people on it? Um, yes, well, I still think that asking the really simple, awkward questions is, is um, a, a very important thing for us to be doing. Um, and, you know, anybody who's studying um, uh, and being able to contest material. Um, people who have options around, you know, a membership of political parties and feeding in um, because life is much easier for us if a coalition partner has written in their party manifesto or promises that they commit to a nationwide time use survey. That makes everything much easier for us than battling it, you know, from the from uh, outside entirely. Um, and we def we know we definitely had the Greens across that line, uh, but of course, Labour then won with a su sufficient majority to push that back. But so those things are important. We need, wherever in uh, any of our union activity, um, even. For uh, example, if you uh, have a governance role in any kind of organisation, to keep insisting that the voluntary hours keep being added to the budget, for example, these kinds of things, these little things, all the time, pushing them back. I've been working with a group who got one of the, the big MB grants and... Um, you know, some of the contract workers were, were written down as 30 hours a week. I was saying, this is, I know you're not working 30 hours a week, like it's closer to 50. Don't think MB can get away with thinking you're producing all of this in 30. So it's all of that kind of consciousness and just pushing a little more, all of us, all the time, finding the language that explains, you know, that, um, that, Thing. And, and also teaching people about outrage. So uh, I've just been writing a module for um, some undergraduates for next year. And so one of the ways of teaching them that outrage was to ask them to look up New Zealand's um, figures for fixed capital formation. Right. And when you do that, the thing that shocks everybody, it's just like guaranteed. Because it's the most shocking line entry and New Zealand has nothing registered beside it, um, which is weapons and munitions, <laughs> right? So we're still engaged in national income and how to pay for the war. This is extraordinary. This is... Fix, sitting there beside schools and hospitals in fixed capital formation. You see, this is a this paradigm is really unhealthy for the planet. 
right. So knowing little things like this and popping them, you know, into questions with um, mainstream economists is a kind of a good idea too. Yeah, but just be creative with it, I think, is the really important thing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, is this the next question? Or does everybody want to answer that? Um, well, the government from Chester, the government would say they'd taken the first steps uh, in terms of their wellbeing budget um, and the development of that. Uh, and we'll see that soon in the budget. Um, and I think they, yeah, the, there's a little, I can't sort of tell you what it is, but there's an, a, an interesting little change in some nomenclature uh, this time that Susie might recognize when she notices. Um, and that has been helpfully influenced by the engagement of Māori and Pacific people in the Treasury Challenge Group, so that the word capital, for example, appears in less offensive spaces um, in the next round. But, you know, if you look at what's going on with wellbeing, there's plenty for us to do for female human rights, for example. The worst determined space in this is what's called social well-being. And the first iterations of social well-being were the number of traffic accidents per year, uh, the number of homicides, and then a question that asked whether or not you felt safe in your neighborhood. And wow, surprise, surprise. There was about a 50% difference between the feedback for men and for women, right? So, but the, then there's the point of saying, unsafe in our neighborhoods, some of us aren't safe in our homes, or safe in our work, or safe in heaps of other places. If this is a genuine attempt to measure safety, this indicator has nothing to do with women, and it's obviously no women were consulted, right? And actually measuring safety for women is very, very tough. And it's why you don't even find violence against women as an indicator in the sustainable development goals. And the other one that's missing from the sustainable development goals is time use. So we've got plenty of spaces and places to push back and to agitate, it seems to me. And we, we, we shouldn't just sit quietly and take it. Oh, kia ora. sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize that I was on mute. Um, thanks for that, Dr. Waring. Uh, Basan, you've got your hand up. Yep, hi. Um, my question is, um, again, um, about, about the government uh, evaluating sustainable policies. Um, now, um, do you see like, like, a pressure on the government uh, from the business community, uh, especially um, while they are developing short-term and long-term sustainable policies, um, especially because um, when a government is wanting to uh, do something in regards to climate change or any other sustainable policy for that matter, they get uh, pressurized heavily from the business community and that compromises on the policy decision that they uh, take in the end. Um, do you think it's, it's a thing for the past or it's it's heavily happening in today's world? 
it depends on the country, I would say. Um, uh, like there, you know, let's let's be frank. In very many places, there's plenty of graft and corruption, um, and uh, there's also, you know, piracy <laughs> of logging in forests and fisheries, and you know, it's it's very very difficult out there. Uh, where New Zealand is, um, uh, I think, not going as fast as many would like, but uh, it's given a clear indication to oil and gas. It's given a clear indication for coal, though we haven't done terribly well on importation of coal. Um, there are some very clear messages uh, to the agricultural industry um, but, you know, a lot of, of messages are going to come in different ways. So when, let's say, the Swiss and French re reinsurance companies start refusing to reinsure um, companies, either because they are uh, flood or climate change prone or earthquake prone or close to the coast or... Um, not uh, reporting social, economic and governance issues on an annual basis. Um, that will hit them in the pocket, but it will also start uh, to hit consumers. You know, possibly the biggest um, challenge to New Zealand's agricultural exports are in fact consumer resistance. Um, and that's a high motivator for people to keep moving very quickly. In a, a kind of functioning, reasonably transparent democracy like New Zealand, um, mostly we find out. Um, but listen, in some of the really major polluters, the situation is completely opaque and none of us would ever know. Thank you. I might say, listen, do you you look at Landsat? Have you ever Sorry. looked at Landsat? OK, so, you know, the environmental satellites that measure the changes. So lots of the countries that don't report properly. The Enviro satellites are now measuring. And they're, they're incredible to watch. I think they've just launched number eight or number nine. I mean, some of the news is dreadful, but you do feel good about the fact that people are watching. Kia ora, thank you for that, uh, Basan and Dr. Waring. Uh, Rosa? Kia ora. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a more practical question. I hope that's okay. Um, so you've been doing this work for such a long time in many forms, um, you know, to do with the environment and working with an inherently sort of sexist economic system. Um, I just wondered how you have almost like mentally as a person been able to stay in this space where it can be feel so difficult to really make um, super tangible change um, that's really easy to see and out as it like with outcomes um, because I don't know I think for for a lot of us we're wanting to work in these spaces but it's so easy to burn out and just feel really um, I don't know depressed and so um, you know nothing's going to change and I just wondered how emotionally as a person you've dealt with that um well, a lot of the time I bore myself, you know, because I think, oh, God, do I have to say all of that all over again? Um, but I, I, I always think to myself, no, no, you know, they want me to be too tired and they want me to be quiet and they want me to go away. And they would really rather people like me just, you know, merged off to the corner. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, the reason that, you know, um, armaments and munitions can sit there and fix capital formation is because people weren't there. 
you know, and weren't watching when that sleight of hand occurred. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, um, any time I have to prepare for um, talking to like a, a group like you, I make myself go and look up some new stuff as well. So I use it as a learning activity. doesn't mean that what I learn is always great, but that's how I just found out that there was a genuine progress indicator bill before the US Congress. So I thought that was, yeah, that was, you know, I don't know how well it'll get on, but great. Um, yes, and I, I also think to myself, we're so privileged here. You know, nobody's going to knock on my door and come for me in the middle of the night. And, you know, I should be able to jump up and down and um, be as um, a, a, be an advocate for those who can't. Yeah. I can't speak for them, but I can try and um, communicate some of their stories. Thank you. Thank you for that. And that was such a great uh, question, Rosa. Thanks for that, uh, Dr. Waring. Um, I've got another question from uh, Robin. Um, so oh. Robin has said, oh, mm. are you there? Degrowth it... scenarios. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, the, the, the point I was making about uh, national superannuation was that, in fact, we've had an experience of having very large numbers of people on the UBI for a very long time. And we, we can see that they don't just become a burden on the state and that they carry on doing a whole range of things. Um, yeah, well, the problem with degrowth scenarios as a term, right, is that I'm no longer... Um, is that it's still in the same paradigm, if you see what I mean. There's masses of things for all of us to do. It's like there isn't, it's not like there's a, a, a lack of, um, as we saw in loads of the environmental um, work that's been got up under COVID, for example. Um, Here's the thing about when you say degrowth. So the growth figures, for example, were measuring the financial intermediation of that 300 million of Catholic money that passed through some trust in New Zealand and on to buy properties somewhere else, right? What When people say degrowth, the thing is that they're still looking at that GDP figure, right? But you've got to just you take all the shit out of the GDP figure, right? You take out, um, there was a wonderful economist from California who used to talk about the goods, the bads, and the regrettables. So that the only things that continue are the and you stop the bad and get you back to regeneration. But growth doesn't measure good. Growth measures miles of crap and shit as well. Right? So we can get rid of that. And we can still keep on with the goods part. Thanks for that, Dr. Waring. Um, We've got another question, which is from uh, Stella, and she's saying, do you need, do you see a need to reform or improve the existing economic curriculums at uh, New Zealand tertiary institutions? Um, well, I think obviously. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I would love to see really rich um, majors available in, in things like indigenous um, well-being. I try and even stay away from the word development because people too frequently just associate that with GDP growth. Um, uh, feminist 
um, economics, highly contested areas in there that a number of us disagree with others of us on. Um, making it really rich and inclusive instead of just really pushing this old Eurocentric Western paradigm. Um, it isn't that old Western Eurocentric paradigm isn't doing the world very good. Thanks for that, Dr. Waring. And um, I guess we can keep to one more question from Sophie. Um, and she says here, what are your thoughts on the future of agriculture in uh, New Zealand? And it, it's obviously a large part of the economy, but also contributes largely to environmental issues. And what are your thoughts on how we can change our agricultural systems? I guess this <laughs> is a nod to our first conversation uh, earlier this evening, but um, go for it, Dr. Yeah, Moore. Well, I, I think there are many people in New Zealand who love the soil and know how to farm the soil and people who are um, learning to take care of our waterways, our rivers. Um, I, I There's so much to learn from Tangata Whenua as well in this. Um, oh, what's her name? I'm going to listen to her tomorrow. She's wonderful. Um, oh, I wish it would come. Anyway, it, I, I heard her make a presentation once and she said, oh, we've just been making the a strategic plan for our farm. And then she paused for a moment and she said, for the next 100 years. You know, we have... It, it's around us. We can learn this. We can still have um, a, a, a country that produces wonderful, fresh, safe food that does it without contributing in, in the kind of destructive way. So forms of regenerative agriculture. I don't think uh, New Zealand will ever stop being a kind of a large farm, but we can certainly do it more safely for the planet. Thanks for that, Dr. Waring. Um, was there, uh, I guess, uh, before we close, would you, if there's one thing that you would like uh, our participants to take away from uh, your session this evening, uh, what would that be? Um, I think that through the lockdown and COVID in New Zealand, everybody has learned how ridiculous the boundary of production is. From one moment to the next, we have moved between unpaid and paid work. It's just like the woman in Africa who goes to get the bucket of water and then uses the water to prepare food, to wash children, to water plants, to wash the animals, et cetera, et cetera. She can't tell you from one moment to the next with her bucket of water, which was supposed to be counted, but wasn't, whether she's inside or outside the production boundary. In lockdown, we have all been looping backwards and forwards across the production boundary using our household assets, for our primary production, because we can't actually survive without the kettle and the microwave, right? And the desk and the computer and everything else. So just like Uber and just like Airbnb started to really transgress on that uh, boundary of production, so has COVID. And so we have to really, we've, we're in a situation where people now can understand this message about economics, right? When you get when you send your papers or whatever it is to your accountant for your tax return, if you haven't done it this year or, or, or thinking about it for the next year, there are whole new challenges for the accountant, you know, which is well, part of this electricity bill actually was not household consumption. It was used in the service production of these other things. I think we just want to contest and confuse. Um, and we could probably amuse while we do it as well. 
Karawe, thank you so much, Dr. Waring. Um, if everyone has the chat function, uh, or the applause function, it would be great yeah. to give uh, Dr. Waring a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, it was uh, really, really um, insightful. And yeah, it was really awesome. I think everyone is uh, agrees with me on that. Uh, Again, thank you very much for joining us this evening and taking the time to um, uh, to chat with us, and especially everyone also who attended our um, our session this evening. And if you're interested in more related to this topic, please uh, feel free to check out uh, the other initiatives of our organization. Um, Rethinking Economics New Zealand aims to promote pluralism, diversity, and economics, and encourage accessibility to, to economics education. And um, just to tie into one of Dr. Waring's answers before we have an initiative for our uh, curriculum review project, uh, please do get in touch if you're interested. And we have a lot of exciting initiatives and events that are planned for the upcoming month upcoming months um, and you can always visit us on our social media channels and our website for more information for more information uh, thanks again that concludes our session this evening and we are on time i this is a uh, very <laughs> we, we have stuck to time it was very uh, very well done um, concludes our session and moving towards a resilient future and a well-being centered economy and thank you again to everybody who attended this evening mm. kia ora, oh, well. kia ora. Thank, kia ora. thank you thanks. dr waring yeah,